I remember exactly how I felt and how I reacted when I walked out of my seventh grade classroom 40 years ago to be punched in the face by another boy. In fairness, he had warned me during class that this punch was coming because I had looked at him and smiled. Richie was new to town. He was working hard on his reputation as a tough kid, a kid that could handle himself, one that others would respect. But as his punch connected, I found myself defenseless. With a few others watching on, feelings of shame and embarrassment quickly took over. I picked up my books and I scampered off to the nearest bathroom where I stood quietly and cried. At that moment, I just wanted to escape tremendous fears, sadness, but most of all, this feeling of just not measuring up. As I reflect back, I see that I had no ability to look inside and feel any level of self-compassion. And of course, I couldn't empathize with Richie either, even though it was his struggles that prevented him from receiving my smile. From an early age, I was the man of the house. My grandfather and I were severely outnumbered with my mom, my grandmother, my sister, and my two aunts. I took my role very seriously, so I helped my mom find her medicine, I helped my sister bring in the groceries, I organized all my toy cars entirely by myself. So, <laughs> yes, you're right, I was really keeping the household running. <laughs> I was 19 when I got the call that my grandfather had passed, and when I did, I had absolutely no idea how to react. I was now legally an adult, so I was actually a man, and now I was the only man left in the family. How could I ever be expected to be strong and protect in the future if I couldn't be strong and find a way to get through this? Various friends came to be supportive, but it wasn't until one of them said, and I quote, every one of us is entitled at least one pity party a day, that I burst into tears. I quite literally needed permission to feel emotions in what was obviously an emotional situation. Somehow, by age 12, I had received enough messages to know that guys are supposed to be tough. We don't back down. We don't show emotion. We definitely don't show weakness or ask for help. We respond with anger and more violence, or we close down. Shutting down my emotions was the path I went. Rather than reaching out for support from friends or family, I tucked this experience away like I would with so many others over the years and moved forward pretending everything was just fine. The only thing that mattered at that moment was that other people believed that I was in control and that I could handle anything that came my way, even while fear and insecurity grew inside. Looking back, I know exactly what was at play. i had been conditioned from a young age to see myself as a man, but the problem is I wasn't a man. I was a child. And when I should have been learning how to connect with people or to express myself in important and emotionally healthy ways, I was instead internalizing all of those implications that come along with being a man. So what does being a man mean? Matt and I learned very similar definitions of what it means to be a man, despite having incredibly different uh, personal identities and growing up across the country at different times. Society conflates being a man with not having the full human emotional experience. So if being a man is supposed to be being tough, not showing pain, and shutting down your emotions, it's pretty easy to see how that can lead to hurting others, not caring, and an overall lack of empathy. A little bit of story time. I was at a high school recently, and I was leading a workshop all about exploring gender, and I asked the students if they could come up with a definition of what it means to be a man. After they shouted out some things that they thought fit the bill, one student in particular looked so upset, so I had to ask, what's wrong? To which he replied, I don't know, it just sucks. I mean, I want to be more than hungry, angry, and horny. <laughs> Let's be clear. Men and masculinity are not inherently bad. There's plenty of people that identify as men or identify as masculine that are doing very strong work to uplift the community. What is harmful are the controlling stereotypes of how to perform gender, especially masculinity. I'm sure everyone in this room has noticed the term toxic masculinity has become a bit of a buzzword and more than a bit polarizing. But I think that's exactly why it's critically important to understand what that term really means and why this conversation makes us uncomfortable. Understanding the ways in which masculinity can negatively affect our lives is the strongest first step in addressing it. 
It was many years later before I could see the connection between any of these experiences as a child and so many that would happen throughout life. This continuous effort of trying to live by these tight and unreachable standards of what it means to be a man often left me falling short. It can be discouraging, it can be depressing, and it can be dangerous. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among Maine youth aged 15 to 24. Boys are taking their own lives at seven times the rate of girls, while they're half as likely to be diagnosed and treated for depression. And this problem doesn't seem to get a lot better with age. Adult men are hurting themselves and taking their lives at alarming rates also. Recent studies have shown that men that strongly believe in stereotypical gender roles tend to prefer male doctors, but they're also pretty likely to lie to them. They seem to prefer female doctors and are a bit more honest with them, but they don't go because they think that male doctors are just better at their jobs. Wait, what? <laughs> Toxic masculinity is really bad for us. This isn't just about men making stupid decisions that play out really badly for us, although that could be an interesting talk on its own. <laughs> Sadly, we don't have to look far to see never-ending stories of harassment and violence, which disproportionately happen at the hands of men. Men are responsible for 90% of the violence today, including violence against other men and horrific levels of violence against women and girls. While the majority of us are not violent men, too many of us have played a role in propping up this culture that's allowed it to be that way. We all have a role to play in changing it. Narrow and restrictive views on gender are fed to us throughout life, but they start pretty early. If you Google the top toys of 2018, you'll find toys that are marketed for girls that use terms like soft and play and glamour and love. And these toys are meant to be looked at or held. You'll find toys that are marketed for boys that use terms like blast, control, hero, and power. <laughs> and these toys are meant to be used in a more dynamic and, frankly, combative way. These toys just uphold the stereotype that femininity is more passive and gentle, while masculinity is more aggressive and active. So many lives could be saved and so much trauma avoided if we took this epidemic of male self-harm and violence against others more seriously. All boys have the potential to recognize and feel and express their full range of emotions. We've all got the ability to push through that shame that prevents us from being vulnerable, particularly when we're hurting and we most need help. Instead of acting out with anger and violence or shutting down emotionally, we've all got the ability to feel that self-compassion and form meaningful connections with others. That punch that Richie delivered over 40 years ago is so symbolic of this issue that we just don't talk enough about. I was 12 years old. I had smiled awkwardly because I didn't know how else to connect with another boy that I knew needed something. I smiled because I cared, and I smiled because somehow I could feel his struggle. But why is it so hard for a boy to smile at another boy and have the emotions behind that smile be received? A smile is this sort of magical window into this wealth of emotions. As we smile, our brain continues to generate more positive emotions. And if received as intended, can bring strong feelings from others. I've smiled at a lot of people since 1972, and I haven't been punched since. <laughs> but to receive a smile, we have to feel worthy of being smiled at. As it turns out, Richie was a lot like me. He was just a little further down that path of burying our emotions and perfecting his own performance of masculinity. It's likely that at age 12, he just was feeling too much and couldn't process whatever it was that he was feeling. All we saw was the anger, the, the tip of the iceberg with everything else pushed so below the surface. Several decades after meeting Richie, I became the executive director of Maine Boys to Men, a nonprofit organization that invests in the healthy development of boys as a means to ending male violence against women and girls. I've witnessed what happens when boys and girls are given permission to talk openly and honestly about the pressures they feel around gender and the impact that has on them. 
It's beautiful to watch boys in middle school connect the dots between these traditional masculine stereotypes and the ways that we disrespectfully treat others. When given the opportunity, these boys increase their awareness and they begin to change their own attitudes around really important topics. Topics like gender equity in relationships and the misuse of power and male privilege. Over time and with practice, they increase their emotional capacity and they begin feeling comfortable just being themselves. In high school, we see empathy build across genders. When these students come together, they begin to change the culture and do amazing things within their school by confronting disrespectful and harmful behaviors well before they become violent. There is always a way out of the dark. If we can learn a behavior, then we can unlearn it or at very least learn a new behavior to help us modify it. At the core of these stories is the fact that boys and men are not taught how to meaningfully connect or that they should even value such things. High school boys do learn that they should prize their toughness or the number of hookups they've had, but not their ability to identify with strangers or the closeness that they share with their partners. High school boys and adult men still shout no homo before they show each other any affection, which just goes to show that non-sexual male affection is still viewed as being strange. We're a social species, and no one of us can exist as an island. Loneliness and isolation have been clinically linked to shorter lifespans and various other health complications. As such, it's time to acknowledge and respect the power of human connection. As the program manager for a local nonprofit called Speak About It, I write programs and curricula that encourage all folks, regardless of their identities, to engage in healthier relationships. These programs always involve a personal component of accessing one's own feelings and emotions, and that's because emotional awareness leads to the ability to have empathy. Empathy for yourself and empathy for others. When you can't have empathy for yourself, it creates this, this internal violence in your head and in your heart that makes it incredibly difficult to have empathy for others. We must make boys and men aware of the fact that it is okay to be vulnerable. To that end, do not encourage limiting views of performing gender. So, for example, if you're a parent and you have a son, don't tell your son to be a man when you really mean be self-sufficient, or have a strong character. And remember that little boys are not the only ones that need to learn that lesson. If there's a man in your life who loves Taylor Swift and his favorite movie is The Notebook, don't make fun of him for liking girly music or for watching chick flicks, but instead engage in a discussion with him about what it is that he likes about those things. What we're saying is offer space to explore emotions. Do that with your friends, lovers, classmates, teammates, coworkers, whoever. Ask people how they feel about things, and then be prepared to tell them how you feel about things. Be vulnerable. Tell somebody that you love them, ask for help when you need it, or even just start by being honest the next time somebody asks, how are you? When we open our hearts and we allow space for others to do so, we stave off isolation and loneliness by inviting a real and meaningful human connection. Matt and I are connected through our response to past trauma, but that's only part of the story. We're also united by our triumphs. We're both still actively unlearning a lifetime of narrow and restrictive messaging on gender, and we've decided to dedicate our professional lives to helping others do the same. That, however, does not have to be the path that everybody takes. True strength lies in our ability to connect in meaningful ways with others. Self-compassion, vulnerability, and empathy are the pathways to getting there. I'm so inspired to see other people that do this well and make it look easy. Our collective ability to practice this and model this as best we can is a tremendous gift for future generations. Community-wide violence prevention programs that specifically start with the healthy development of our children are so imperative to our future. By supporting and advocating for this sort of work in your schools and your communities, we will reverse these troubling trends. Thank, Thank you. you.